Hey, and shalom, everybody. I am on uh, in a new place. Hallelujah. The Lord has blessed me with a beautiful new apartment that I'm uh, slowly but surely moving into. So praise God. Um, I'm on. Yay. Hi, Joanne. God bless you. <laughs> shalom from a new place. Hallelujah. <laughs> Um, the Lord has given me a, a message to encourage everybody concerning wells. This morning he woke me up and he just said, talk about wells, talk a little bit about wells. And so the scriptures talk, talk about, um, I know, praise God, um, the well, uh, the Lord, the scriptures talk about wells as being um, places of, of life, right? Because water uh, is necessary to sustain life. And back then water wasn't always so readily accessible. And so oftentimes these wells were connected. Hey, George, God bless you. Shalom, shalom. Good to have you both on. Um, so oftentimes these wells were connected to provision. They were connected to life. Hola, como estas? Uh, and these wells were um, places where, uh, where, where people we're able to to live, right? Where there is water, there is life. Just like where there's a river, that's where all of the trees grow and that's where all of the animals flock to. And so in the same way, whenever a well was broken open in antiquity, it allowed tribes, groups of people to not just set up camp, but to live and to begin building cities and uh, begin expanding their communities and their families. And so um, the Lord is just, you know, talking uh, about wells and the relationship between wells and altars. So we've been talking about altars. Uh, we've been talking about those consecrated spaces, the geographical spaces in the earth that the Lord wants his children to not just be aware of, but to, uh, but to, be intentional about concerning the way that we interact with certain spaces. Um, I don't want to say too much before I pray, <laughs> but um, but yeah. So those so altars altars in antiquity were physical spaces where heaven and earth met. They were uh, uh, portals, right? They were geographical locations where the angels would ascend and descend. They were landmarks. They had some type of uh, demarcation tool that said, this is an altar unto a deity. And that's where people would go to see visions, to have revelation, to seek the Lord, etc. But uh, on the other hand, there is also wells that were built in designated spaces uh, where God made promises to people, uh, where God visited people, um, but also where God allowed people to set up camp because of the flow of water that was literally coming from underneath their feet. And so um, during this time of growth and momentum for the people of God, a lot of things are shifting, right? We're, we're moving, we're, hallelujah, we're moving, we're, we're um, starting things, organizations, nonprofits, businesses, where our networks are expanding, right? We're not shrinking at this time. This is the time for the people of God to expand in, uh, in, in to the greatest degree possible. And part of that expansion is remembering the way that expansion took place over 2000 years ago. And when expansion happened, in antiquity, it was always related to altars, and it was always related to wells. And so um, I'm not going to talk so much about altars this week, because we've, I think, talked about it for two weeks within the last month. But um, now we're going to move on to wells. So praise God. That was a mouthful. We're going to just begin with a prayer, and um, and then we'll jump in. So I'm glad that everybody's on, and I, I hope that the, con the connection is um, solid. Uh, I don't have Wi-Fi yet, so um, I just cover this T-Mobile reception with the blood of Jesus, and I pray God against um, cell interfe interference in Jesus' name. So everybody, please bow your head and close your eyes with me, and we will begin. So Father, we just, we come before you, Lord. Thank you, God. 
<clears throat> we come before you, Father, just uh, excited to um, be in your presence, excited to uh, hear another word, God, excited just to, to allow our spirit man to be fed, Father. I thank you, God, for just laying aside all of the things from the week, God, the anxiety, the pressures, the um, disappointments of the week, Father. We just lay them down before you. And uh, we, we pray, Father, for focus. God, may we hear you in this time, Lord. May we focus on the things that you want us to focus on, God. And we even take this time, Lord, to repent, Father, for any sins that we may have committed knowingly or unknowingly this week, God. We ask that you would wash us, that you would cleanse us, and we thank you and we receive your forgiveness, God. You said in your word that there is no condemnation for those in, who are in Christ Jesus. And so, Father, I thank you, God, for just purified vessels, um, hungry vessels and vessels, Lord, that are just ready, God, to keep marching forward. Lord, I thank you, Father, that we are going forward. I thank you, Father, that you are increasing us every single week. I thank you, Father, that you are pouring out revelation hidden things, God, that have, have, you know, I've never seen or I've never even heard about, but things that are literally in that, in, in those books. And so, Father, I just thank you, God, for meeting every single one of us, God. Use, um, use uh, my work, my mouth to release the words, Father, that are on your heart, God. Divide up the words so that it can be received by every single person that listens now or later in the name of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we thank you, God, just for, for meeting us. We thank you, God, for changing and for encouraging us uh, over the next 30 minutes or so. Lord, we love you and we praise you. <clears throat> In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Let's, let's jump into this. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so um, we're going to begin in Deuteronomy 6, verse 10 to 12. <clears throat> this is a promise that the Lord gives um, gives through Moses, the prophet. And this is a promise that many of us have probably heard, uh, but a promise that is so beautiful and so uplifting. And it's like, wow, you know, this is, this is, this is a promise that God gives to the descendants of Abraham. And as we know, those who are in Christ have been grafted into uh, the promises of Abraham, the covenants that were made with Abraham, right? We're in that lineage spiritually, may not be biologically, but spiritually we are in the lineage of Abraham. So the promises that were given to him also fall on us. And so this is one of the promises that God gives to Abraham in Deuteronomy chapter six. <clears throat> it says, it says, <clears throat> Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you, somebody say me, <laughs> amen. <laughs> okay, I'm starting over. Then it shall come about when the Lord your God shall bring you into the land which he swore, he solemnly promised to give your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you a land with great and splendid cities which you did not build, and houses full of all good things which you did not fill, and hewn or ex excavated cisterns or wells which you did not dig out, and vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you eat and are full and are satisfied, right? So the Lord promises, right, to give these things to his uh, his children, to, to the descendants, to the inheritors of the promises that he made to Abraham, right? And so it says, hallelujah, that we will be given great and splendid cities. Anybody, you know, want a city? <laughs> Anybody been dreaming about a city, right? He says that he will give entire cities to the people of God, right? He says he will give houses that are turnkey ready, you know, without having to fully furnish them yourselves. Places that are prepared for his children, right? And that's something that that the scriptures talk about a lot, this idea of a prepared place, that Jesus 
goes to prepare a place for us in heaven, right? But this idea that there is something always being prepared for the children of God, that God isn't like last minute saying, oh, they're here, let me just give them this. It's like, no, he's, he's building something for us that we can walk towards so that when we get there, we can just sit down, put our feet up and enjoy, right? So it says that, um, that the houses will be full of all good things, which we did not fill, right? So storehouses that have provision, storehouses that have um, access to uh, clean drinking water, whatever it may be, right? I, I think about um, some of these ranches that are for sale. There's so many ranches all over the United States and South America that are for sale. And these operations are major operations, multi-thousand or million dollar operations, but they're completely sufficient, self-sufficient, self-sustaining and autonomous uh, pieces of property. You know, of course it's like hundreds or thousands of acres, but they have clean drinking water, they have their own water supply, they have their own generators, they have their own solar panels, they have their own, of course, their own crops, their own vineyards, right? These are literally plots of land that could be turned into a city, could could be operational for a city. And many of the times, right, the groceries that are supplied to our local grocery store are coming from these farms. So in a way, these farms and these ranches are supplying cities, city, city, um, city levels of food, like, like food that is to the uh, amount or degree that would be able to satisfy an entire city, right? And so, um, so I think, you know, I think that, you know, these things are not, you know, hard to imagine, they exist, you know, they, they, they exist. Um, and they're, and people buy these ranches all the time, right? And so the Lord says that there are places, right? There are places that he has prepared for you that he is waiting for you to get to. He's waiting for us to get to, right? There are certain uh, geographical locations. There are certain industries that are just waiting for our gifts, that are waiting for our uh, prayers, right, to step into. And so God is always uh, revealing promises to his children, but it's our responsibility, right, to not just see the promise, to hear the promise, but to believe the promise and to walk and step towards that promise, right? And so, you know, this is not just like a prosperity message, you know, because that's really, those can be kind of shallow, but um, this is just a message about, about the things that God has prepared for us, right? It says that he is a generous father who loves to lavish good gifts on his children. And so, we are entering the time of lavishing. Literally, we're entering the time of lavishing. And I was um, in my old apartment, I was singing to the Lord, and um, he was just having me sing about these gifts. Like, he was like, <laughs> I forget what the lyrics were, but it was like, you know, it's time to open the gifts, and like, there's all these gifts, and God was just showing me all these present boxes, you know, like, there's all this stuff that he's been like waiting for us to um, to open, right? Just like a parent buys Christmas gifts all month or even earlier, right? They're like just holding those gifts, waiting for the day, waiting for the day of release. And we know that we are stepping towards a great wedding banquet, right? We're, st oh my gosh, this is not, I'm going on a little bit of a tangent, but we're stepping towards a great celebration. We're stepping towards a time where we will be married to the bridegroom, right? Where he will receive the reward of his suffering, right? He suffered uh, and he's been patient and he's been waiting for this great banquet, this great marriage ceremony. And that's between his bride, his church and him. And so at this ceremony, right, there's gifts <laughs> you know, what are the gifts that the groom gives to the bride and vice versa. And so, you know, that's like, that's, that's a day, that's like the ultimate day. But even before that, the Lord is saying that 
there are things right that we are stepping towards that he's wanting to release unto us and we are um we just have to keep keep marching keep marching and we will literally see them unfold before our eyes in jesus name so back to the scripture so it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says that he will give us great and splendid cities which we did not build, right? And houses full of all good things which you did not fill, and excavated wells which you did not dig out, and vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you eat and are full and are satisfied, right? Thank you, Jesus, for the time of eating and being full and being satisfied, where we're no longer wanting anything, where we have more than enough, right? That is his desired goal, one of his desired goals for us. But then in verse 12, it gives a warning and he says, Then beware that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery, right? So we are... Um, being delivered right we are being delivered from the systems of the world we are being delivered from um, poverty and we are be being delivered from health complications things that would keep us in any form of lack right and so this journey of being um, full and satisfied is one that god takes has taken his people through for many many generations many thousands of years Right? He, he always allows his people right to, to rely on him to get from Egypt <laughs> to the promised land, to the promise, right? And so uh, at this point, you know, we've been walking for many of us for a long time, many of us for almost our entire lives, but um, we, are, we are approaching, right? We're closer than we were. And um, there's something in the air. It's like you can, you know, you can feel it. You can kind of taste it that that the, the way that things were are literally passing away and the world has, the earth has entered into a, a whole new era. And so, um, and so the Lord wanted me to focus on these wells, right? It says that we will receive excavated wells, which we did not dig out. So the well, the wells, hallelujah. So in Genesis chapter 26, it talks about wells that um, <clears throat> Isaac dug. And these wells that Isaac dug were wells that were previously dug by Abraham. And so we know that, again, that these wells were literally life sources for people to be able to exist in these desert regions, right? Not everybody was close to a river. And so where they, when they weren't close to a river, they had to um, dig a well. <laughs> and so it says, uh, and so wells also were, were highly contested, right? These were areas of, of prime real estate, right? If you had a well on your land, then you were, uh, probably had, uh, you were in pretty good standing, right? Um, I'm trying to think of a, a, a parallel, uh, right? If you, if you dug uh, in Texas, you dug a well and you were able to strike oil, I think that you would be doing pretty well, right? <laughs> so this is in a time where oil wasn't utilized in the way that it is now, but um, water was as valuable as oil or water was even as valuable as gold back then liquid gold um they're talking about you know they're referring to water as liquid gold nowadays because it's been so um commodified and privatized but anyway so if you had a well and if that well was flowing then you were in good shape and so it says that um, even throughout Abraham's life that he was able to dig many wells and he was a very, very wealthy man. He had thousands of livestock. He had like, like, I mean, eventually thousands and more, more descendants than he could imagine, right? He had so much. He was a very, very, very prosperous man, highly favored by the Lord. And it says that his son, Isaac, uh, began to dig and reopen uh, wells that his father had dug. So I'm going to pick up in Genesis 26, verse 18. It says, Now Isaac again 
dug and reopened the wells of water which had been dug in the days of Abraham his father because the Philistines had filled them up with dirt after the death of Abraham, right? So after Abraham had died, these Philistines, these foreigners, stepped onto his land and began to fill them up, right? They began to sabotage, sabotage the blessing that he had been given. They began to close up the sources of life that uh, Abraham was able to unlock, right? So, I mean, it's pretty wicked to think about. You know, the, here you have great, um, here you have land that, you know, beautiful land that is is the fulfillment of a promise that God had given to this man. And people were full of jealousy and uh, full of envy. And they sab literally sabotaged this man's property, right? <laughs> they sabotaged this man's property. And that, geez, I mean, that still happens today, you know? Um, with all types of industries, with oil, with electric, I'm sure with natural gas, but anyway, and so it says that after Abraham had died, right, then, then they took advantage of the property because Abraham was not watching over it, right, because he was deceased. And it says, and he gave the wells the same names that his father had given them, right? So Isaac breaks open these wells that had been out of use for many years and he renames them the original name that Abraham had named them, right? And when we name things, we declare the destiny over those things, right? We declare the um, future of those things, right? If you, you know, name your child um, failure and you call the child failure come here you know every day you know what do you think what do you think they're going to turn out to be and if you name your your child a virtue virtuous <laughs> and you call your child virtuous every single day what do you think that they'll become right so when we name things we declare the future of those things and so it says that isaac renamed uh, the wells, he changed the Philistine names of those places and and renamed them the things that Abraham had called them during his time. And it's not, ex it doesn't explicitly say what those names were, but it's the idea, the principle of returning the, uh, the, the, the wellspring back to its original state. And it says, but when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of flowing water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdmen, herdsmen, saying, the water is ours, right? So, so Isaac named the well Esek, quarreling, because they quarreled with him, right? So Isaac unlocks these old wells that belong to his father, but then he also takes it a step further by digging new wells. And he was able to locate a well that was flowing with water. And so there's at least two different types of wells. One that we know of, right? This long kind of cavernous um, chute that goes down into the earth that people put a, a bucket into, lower the bucket, draw the bucket up and it's full of water, right? That's, that's a kind of standard well. But then there's also wells that are called springs, which I'm sure many of us have heard of as well. A, a, well, uh, a well spring, uh, which is a well that actually doesn't require any um, labor to pull or draw the water out of it. So it's that is due to the Earth's kind of natural pressure around that area or around that um, region that actually forces the water up and out of the ground. And so it says that Isaac was able to discover a, basically it's a spring, right? He, his people were digging, they dug down deep, they broke something open and then water began gushing up, right? So of course, you know, that would be a much more valuable type of well because then people don't have to use their arms and create use the basket and use the string and do all the things, right? They can just go to the water and it's there fresh, bubbling up for them to just be able to drink from directly 
or you know bottle up in some fashion and take with them and so it says that the um that the herdsmen of gorar right korebeshi quarreled with isaac and they said that the water is theirs right um and so it says then Isaac's servants dug another well, and they quarreled over that also. So Isaac named it Sitna, right? And so this well, these wells, right, were highly contested. Isaac wasn't just, you know, able to tap into a blessing, tap into a source, and enjoy it for himself. No, he was met with opposition. He was met with thieves, right? He was met with other people that were, you know, looking over his shoulder saying, I want what that person has. And so if we think about our, the place that we're at and the place that we're going, people are bound to be envious. People are bound to want to try to, you know, people like to take, you know, take, <laughs> people like to take. People love to take, my God. And so, um, and so just like the scripture talks about in Deuteronomy 6, where it says that the Lord will bless us with, with houses we didn't build, splendid cities, vineyards we didn't plant, and excavated wells, it also warns us that there will be people that will try to uh, take those blessings or try to intervene in some way or try to siphon them off and so just remembering that is something that we should be conscious of as we um hallelujah as we uh, as we receive from the lord right we can't tell everybody everything right there is power in uh, secrecy there is power in in being reserved about how much information we share and so through this time of preparation i believe that the lord has also been teaching many of us how to bridle our tongues how to watch what we say and ask ourselves why are we saying this uh what's the purpose of saying this and to also assess our motives as to why we share certain things and so i just i, I believe that um, that part of being able to preserve the blessing that the Lord releases unto us is by being discreet, using discretion, uh, using discernment about what to share, how to share, and um, also, of course, to seek the Lord, to really seek the Lord about what to do with everything that is literally uh, like flowing to us in this season, in Jesus' name. And so it says in verse 22, he moved away from there and he dug another well and they did not quarrel over that one. So he named it Rehoboth or broad places. And he said, for now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be prosperous in the land, right? This is so powerful and so beautiful, right? That, that it was this, it was this third new well that Isaac had to dig right, that was finally one that wasn't quarreled over. It was one that he was able to just enjoy the fruits of. And it says that he named it Broad Places, right, that, that this well was a sign that the Lord had expanded his territory, that it was no longer contested territory, that it was no longer, you know, was it his territory? Was it his well? Was it the herdsmen of Gerar's well? Whose well was it? No, it was like at this point, it was Isaac's well, right? At this point, this is, you know, your well, right? Where nobody will be able to say, you know, I want a piece of this. This is the thing that I, you know, I want to claim or whatever. And so he named it Broad Places. He named it Expansion, right? And he says that we shall be prosperous in the land because the Lord has finally made room for us, right? And so the Lord is wanting, right, to make room for the people of God. And he is, right? He's making room for us. He's making room for us. He's making room for us. But part of that room making is tied to the discovery of wells, the discovery of wells, the discovery of places, the discovery of things that the Lord wants us to steward. And so, you know, 
a well, I'm thinking about a couple of things that a well could be, you know. Um, a well is a place of, of um, it's, it's a place of provision. It's a place where resources are poured out, right? It's a place of spiritual provision, right? So if, I guess if we think naturally about a natural well right now, it could be, uh, it could be a a um, it could be like an organization, right? It could be a business. It could be something that is always kind of bubbling up. That there's something flowing from it that's able to feed and water and bring refreshing to people, you know. And I I uh, went to a uh, a school in New York. It was called um, Cooper Union, and it was founded like I think over 150 years ago, just about 150 years ago. And it was founded on the principle that education should be free for all. And it was a free school for anybody that got accepted. Uh, it was a very small school with, you know, I think less than um, maybe like less, definitely less than 5,000 people, maybe around a thousand students you know, with a low acceptance rate, but the whole thing was free. It was free for anybody that got accepted. And um, and in a way, it was kind of like a well, you know, it's like there was this education that was flowing from this place. There was this wisdom, this knowledge, these resources that were flowing from this place for 150 years, right? For 150 years, thousands and thousands of People, kids, right, were getting a free education in New York City, uh, which, you know, now really doesn't exist. Um, and so the the year after I got accepted, they started charging tuition. <clears throat> and it was this big, um, this big, horrible um, political war and battle that the school and the students and the faculty and the um, leadership of the institution and even the city, you know, all got involved in, 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 in fighting over. And uh, ultimately, the, because of a mismanagement of funds, because of poor leadership, hey, Joy, God bless you, shalom, shalom. <laughs> Um, because of poor leadership, the school began charging tuition and there went a, a legacy, a 150 year legacy of free tuition that was just kind of taken over because of these kind of Philistines, right, that had blocked up the well, they had stopped the well, they had messed up the flow, they messed up the system, they messed up the foundation that was started back then, uh, and and it just kind of got plugged up, you know? And so I think of that as a kind of natural, you know, a, a, an organizational well that um that 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 has existed right and so when the lord is encouraging us to find those wells find those places that have existed before our time that he wants us to dig up again we have to ask him what is, what does that look like what are those places right because throughout this nation there there have been thousands uh and probably millions of christians that have started different things, started organizations, started charities, started programs, um, started something, right? That they that they ran with, that they pioneered under the guidance of the Lord. And we know that it's very difficult to keep something going for a long amount of time, especially after you die, right? Especially after you die. And that's why it says that the herdsmen of Gerar plugged up the wells of Abraham only after he died, right? Because he wasn't able to watch over them anymore. And so there are certain things, even in this nation, that have been plugged up, right? That have been co-opted, that, that have been um, desecrated, right? The missions of certain places have been desecrated. You know, I, um, I don't know so much about the history of like the, the YMCA or, or Boy Scouts of America, but certain institutions right, have been co-opted and plugged up and, and inhibited from actually allowing the flow of God 
through those places. And the Lord is like wanting us to look back at history. He's wanting us to partner with him to seek some of these places and to find some of those models that came from God that were implemented into the earth, you know, before our time and to see how they can how can how they can be revived again, you know? Um, how can free tuition be offered again, right? That's not like, it's kind of an extinct model, but it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be. And, and, and I think about, um, you know, I think, I think that God would want something like that to exist again, right? And so, and so when we're, when we're thinking about these wells, right, we, we are to ask the Lord, where are those places? What are those places? Um, how, how can I find those places? Are there any of those places even in my family, right? Are there things that my grandparents started? Are there things that my great-grandparents started? Are there things that existed in my neighborhood? You know, small local things that um, God moved on, you know, that God wants to cause to come alive again, right? And so the, the point, one of the points is that we don't have to always reinvent the wheel, right? We don't have to start from scratch, right? There are certain places where prayer has been at the foundation of building certain things, right? Prayer started this organization and prayer has been fed and fed and fed and, and, and prayer has driven, right? People to, um, has, prayer has, built prayer has been it's almost like a cake prayer has been layered on to certain places to certain ideas to certain even buildings right and it's like we we as god's people can just go into those places reactivate uh reaffirm those prayers add a little bit more add the cherry on top and we can watch miraculous things take place through those um, through those spaces. And I just want to give one more example. And I, I hope that even as I'm talking that the Lord is kind of highlighting some ideas because the concept of a well, it can take a lot of different forms and I don't want it to be limited in any type of way. But but just to kind of get our imaginations going a little bit more, um, there there is a, a, an art studio that the Lord led me to that's a couple of blocks away from my new apartment. And that art studio is located in a church, um, a church, a local church that um, opened its doors to artists in 2004. And it said, we want artists to come in here and make work and and just use the space for like very, very cheap and, and to just, you know, allow this to be kind of like a Christian artist space. And um, it's like, wow, that exists, you know, like that exists and it exists a few blocks away from me. But anyway, so that place was started in 2004 and um, which is almost 20 years ago. And over those 20 years, things change, right? Things always change, right? There's always a founding vision that normally the Lord will be a part of. But through time and through the, um, through inviting other people that, you know, may not be listening to God as intently or whatever, things change, right? And so something has changed about it. I don't really know exactly all the details of what has changed, but I know that it's not uh, as rooted in what it was rooted in 20 years ago, which was in God breathing on these artists' practices. And so the Lord has, you know, led me to this place, you know, to begin working and to to begin, you know, hanging out with this community and talking to this community and, you know, praying and all this stuff. And so I'm in the process of seeing a well, not necessarily be reopened, because I'm not sure if it's been completely shut, but I know that there was something that was dug up, something deep that was opened in that place many years ago. And it's almost like it needs to be cleared out a little bit more right it needs to be it needs to remember uh its founding it needs to be renamed right and that uh, that act of renaming is like it needs to be called its original name again right it needs to be called its original name it cannot be called something foreign 
right? It cannot be called, oh, you know, just just like, you know, the new age studios or like um, universalist studios, artists for all, you know, it's like, no, like there was something deep and there was something spiritually rich about the founding of that space that needs to be remembered, right? And so we know that altars are places of remembrance. They are places, geographical places, where certain things happened, certain spiritual revelation encounters happened, right? They're places of remembrance. And oftentimes those, those altars can or will be connected to wells. So the altar is the place of spiritual transfer and encounter, and the well is a place of spiritual provision and resources, right? And so if we think about that studio as an example, just one of many examples that could be shared, the well it was a place where revelation was just coming, right, from the people, where the artists were dreaming with God, where there was resources to be able to materialize the vision that he was releasing unto the people, right? It was a place where there was a bubbling up, right? And so um, the wells and the altars have to go hand in hand, right? They have to go hand in hand because in a way, it's not enough for a place to just be a site of remembrance. At that site of remembrance, there should still be some type of flow, right? And so we know that God is always flowing. We know that the Spirit of God moves like a flow, like he's a river. <laughs> and, you know, if we know anything about groundwater, these are underground rivers where water is literally coursing underneath our feet. And in a weird way, the ground that we walk on, some of it, is actually floating on water. You know, there's also bedrock and other um, composite materials underneath us. But uh, but when you have like a sinkhole, it's because that water, the, because the ground fell into the water that was underneath it, right? And so, um, and so if God is a well of living water, if Jesus is a well of living water, if the Holy Spirit, right, is a well of living water, he should always be bubbling up, flowing through whatever those spaces are, right? Whatever those spaces are, whether it's your ministry, whether it's your business, right, which can also be a ministry, whether it's your organization, which can also be a ministry, right? Everything that we do as God's people really should be a ministry, whether we call it a ministry or not, it should be it should be uh, advanced through a desire to minister to people right because we are ministers to god and we are ministers to people and so whatever that thing is it it should be a well there should be a well of ideas coming forth there should be a well of a vision coming forth, a well of strategies, right? And so um, these, this is just something that the Lord wants us to really uh, remember and to see because it's, it's ancient, right? These are ancient principles that have not gone away. They may not look the same, but when we're talking about spiritual things, altars were physical, but they were spiritual. And these wells were physical, but they were also spiritual. And so we have to wrap our head around both the natural side of this, but also the spiritual side of this, hallelujah. So, oh my gosh, a mouthful again. And so just to finish the scripture, it says in Genesis 26, um, I'm just gonna read that again so we can get really get it. It says uh, in Genesis 26, 22. Isaac moved away from those places of quarreling and he dug a new well, another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he named it Rehoboth, meaning broad places, saying, for now the Lord has made room for us and we shall be prosperous in the land, right? So that well was associated with prosperity. If you don't have a well, you're not going to be prosperous. If there isn't something in your life that is flowing, teeming with water, right, whatever that may be, then you're not going to be prosperous, unfortunately, right? There has to be something. 
And it says, then he went up from there to Beersheba. The Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and I will favor you and I will multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. Hallelujah. So after Isaac had dug this third well named Rehoboth, he left and he went to a place called Beersheba. And it was at that place of Beersheba that God appeared to him, that he encountered the living God and God told him, I am God. Don't be afraid. I will bless you for the sake of my servant Abraham. And because of that encounter, it says that Isaac built an altar and called on the name of the Lord in prayer. He pitched his tent there and there Isaac's servants dug a well. Hey, hallelujah. There it is. <laughs> I'm just going to read it one more time. It says, so Isaac built an altar there, right? At the place of encounter, what are we always to do? We're to build an altar, right? At the place of encounter, we are to consecrate a certain place and say, this is where the Lord met me. This is a place where I'm going to be praying. This is a place of intercession. This is a holy place that God is in, was in, will be in, and we are going to call it as such, right? That there's intentionality in saying this is an altar unto God and not any demon or anything else, right? My home is an altar to God only in Jesus' name, right? And it says, and he called on the name of the Lord in prayer. So at the altar, we are to pray, right? We are to call on the name of the Lord. And he pitched his tent there, meaning that he set up his living quarters. He said, I'm going to live here because God visited me I'm going to stop, you know, moving about and I'm going to pitch my tent and I'm going to stay here a while because God met me once, meaning that God can meet me again, meaning that there's something about this place that God, that God, there's something about this place that, that is demonstrating that God is active and present and moving here. And it says that, um, Right, and when he pitched his tent, that means that his whole family pitched his tent, right? It wasn't just one person. He was traveling with lots of people because he was a pretty wealthy person. And it says that, that, that he and his, um, and his community really pitched their tents there. They set up shop. And it was there that Isaac's servants dug a well, right? And so the well, right, the well had to be dug where the altar was. The well had to be dug because A, they had to drink water naturally, but B, because where the Spirit of the Lord is moving, there should always be a bubbling up, right? There should always be a flow of the Spirit. And so, um, and so we know that in the New Testament, this is the last scripture I'll share, we know that in the New Testament, Jesus visits this woman at the well, hallelujah, which, the, which, which I believe Abraham uh, or the, the forefathers of the faith had, had, um, had initially opened up. It was a well that was intact for thousands of years, literally, you know. And, and so he, Jesus is at this well, this very strategic well, my God, where encounters are still taking place, literally where the Son of Man, the Son of God, steps foot at, is at this well. And who knew that that well would be visited by God himself in the flesh, you know, hundreds or thousands of years later, right? And so anyway, so Jesus appears at this well, right? Meaning that the well is also a place of visitation. And um, he says, whoever drinks the water that that I give them will never be thirsty again, but the water that I give them will become in them a spring of living water, right? Satisfying the thirst for God, welling up, continually flowing, bubbling from within them to eternal life, right? So um, besides, you know, these, these physical wells that we can think about, these organizational and... Um, 
kind of conceptual wells, right? We also are wells, right? We are wells of living water, meaning that within us, there is the spirit of God that is to bubble up, that is to speak forth, that is to release wisdom, that is to release prayer. And so, um, hallelujah. And so, where's my note? Thank you, Jesus. And so, um, thank you, Lord. And so, and so, wells were places of refreshing as well. And so we, as God's people, on a person-to-person -person basis, right, um, just thinking very uh, immediate, you know, immediately, right, we, we can think about these big organizational things, but on an immediate scale, when it comes to our interactions with our neighbor, with our friend, right, if we are also those wells, right? We should be releasing, refreshing, right? And that's something that, that, that these wells do is they refresh the people that they serve, right? They refresh the people that they serve. A well refreshes the city. A well refreshes the customer. A well refreshes your neighbor. A well refreshes um, one another, right? We're in the process. We're in the state of refreshing one another, right? Through the leading of the Holy Spirit, through our prayers, through our encouragement, through our acts of service, right? Everything that we do, right, should be refreshing to others, right? So, um, Kylie, I hope that that brought things um, somewhat full circle. I think that that is the message that the Lord is leading us to uh, different wells that had been stopped up, things that need to be reopened, things that need to be broken open through prayer. The way that we break open some of these wells is through intercession, is through asking God, and we'll do a little prayer at the end of this, but asking God, where are those places? What is it that you want me to tap into? Uh, what histories are relevant to my calling that you want me to open up? Right. You know, if, even if we think about some of these great ministers like Catherine Coleman, Reinhard Bunke, um, Smith Wigglesworth, right. These people, they didn't just like come out of nowhere. Right. They they tapped into wells. They tapped into the spirit of God that was moving and was building and accumulating in the lives of other ministers for many generations. Right They're Like these things don't just start out of nowhere. Jesus was the source he poured into his 12 disciples. His 12 disciples had spiritual children. Hey, Karen, God bless you, shalom, good to see you. Um, right, he had, they had spiritual children. There's lineages of the, the movements of the spirit. And so we have to look at our landscape, look around our periphery and see, okay, God, where was it that you moved? around me and how can I tap into that and add to it? How can I unlock what the saints that preceded me labored through prayer to to create or to birth? And we'll just see these things kind of just begin to bubble up all around us. And the last thing, I, I, this is a long message, and the last thing I wanna share is that Isaac, he didn't just look for one well, right? He looked for like dozens of wells. It doesn't even say the number. We know that it was at least, in that scripture that I read, it was at least four, right? At least four. So why as God's people can we not be activating and opening this, you know, this organization, tapping into that, tapping into that, um, that type of gathering place, that type of community, right? All around us should just be these geysers just gushing up, right? That is, that is part of the prosperity. That is part of the abundant life. That is, that is what we are stepping into. So people of God, be encouraged. This is, um, this is a time where literally the Lord will show us mysteries and hidden things. This is his desire. It's his heart to reveal those secret things. But it says in the scripture that he reveals it only to his kings or only to those that are walking in the kingship anointing, right? Which means that, that we're not just 
you know, we're not just casual about it. We're not just flippant about it. We're not just like, oh, you know, if God wants to bless me, he'll bless me. It's like, no, no, God wants to bless you. And it's your responsibility <laughs> to figure out how and to seek him for what that blessing is, what that looks like and how to activate it, how to step into it, how to cultivate it, how to shepherd it and how to protect it as well, not just for yourself, but for your generations. So people of God, let's close with a prayer and then this is gonna kick me off because it's almost been an hour, my God. So um, so Lord and uh, Lord, just thank you, Father, for everybody that heard this message. Lord, we just pray together in unity for those that wanna pray. We pray, we pray, Father, that you would lead us to those ancient wells, God. We pray, Father, that you would lead us to the wells of our Christian forefathers. We pray, Father, that you would show us the places that will make us prosperous. Lord, show us the cities that you have the keys to that you want to hand over to us. Lord, show us the spaces that you want to release unto us, God. Show us which doors to knock on, Father, so that we can step into those lofty places, into those expanded places, Father, just like you promised Isaac broad places, Lord. We also have been promised that. So we claim broad places. We claim expanded territory in the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, that even this week, God, that we would be so close to your spirit that we would just be, um, that we would feel and sense and and hear you with greater clarity, God, and that we would just, <laughs> that everything, hallelujah, that everything that's been kind of bubbling underneath the surface, God, that it would be broken open this week in the name of Jesus Christ, and that we would see things come alive, that we would see provision come, that we would see resources come, that we would see, Lord, life just begin to flow up all around us, God. We curse deadness in the name of Jesus. We curse barrenness in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. And we just declare that the rivers of God flow from you to us and to the things that you're wanting us to put our hands on in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. And I just thank you, Father, for power-filled, anointed people of God, Lord, that are that are just excited, excited to move with you, excited to flow with you, and excited, God, to, to birth things uh, and unlock new things in the earth, Lord. I just bless them. I bless you, Lord. And I thank you, God, for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And a quick prayer for anybody that does know the Lord, that would like to receive the Lord, please repeat this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me with your blood. Come into my life and save me. I want to know you and I want to be led to the wells by you. And I want to meet you at the well. Hallelujah. <laughs> In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I love you all, and I just barely made it. But God bless you, and um, I'll see you all next week. Be, uh, be in peace and um, prosper. In Jesus' name.